still have people coming in. So we're just going to give another minute here for everybody to be admitted in. Do we need to tell you that we're here? Do you need our names or does it automatically pop up for you? Um, we'll be getting to a slide. We'll have you put that in the chat box for us. Okay. Yep. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the SAC program planning for summer. It, this is presented by Penn SAC. Um, we will be recording this training for a future viewing. So I'm your facilitator. I'm Shasta Wagner. I work for Cambridge County Child Development Corporation. I'm also the Penn SAC and professional development co-chair. Um, Betsy uh, Sotman from the PA Key SAC Specialist will be um, running behind the scenes. Um, if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat box. We'll also um, we'll be having um, Q&A um, after each segment. So we're going to have four segments. Are you awake? John? Um, Penn SAC is the Pennsylvania School Age Child Care Alliance. Uh, it is the National After School Alliance affiliate for Pennsylvania. Our vision is out of school time is important pillar in youth development in Pennsylvania. And we're here. Um, we advocate for our after school, out of school time professionals, offer professional developments. Um, becoming a member, you can also, um, we keep you up to date with um, current current events and things that are important for you in, in the field. So we're going to ask that you please place your full name and your program name in the chat box. If you are sharing a computer, make sure that everyone is putting their name and program name in the chat box. That way we can make sure that you receive credit. If you are looking for Act 48, um, Betsy's information is here. Please send her an email um, with the following information, your full name, your PPID number, zip code, email address, then that way you um, will receive your Act 48 credits. Hold on one second, go, go back to one slide about the document download. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. There you go. So um, we've also put the PowerPoint in a PDF form in the chat box for you to um, copy and paste and save on your computer, as well as um, Better Kid Care was nice and um, friendly and they shared um, a dozen activities for summer. So that's also in there. So we ask that you go ahead and um, download those. And so we're going to give a pausing moment right now to get your all this administrative stuff done. Um, right now. So we're just going to pause and let you guys do this stuff real quick. So in your chat box, that information, those, that PDF and that Microsoft Outlook document are going to be, um, Microsoft Word, excuse me, are going to be um, at the very top of that chat box. Linda, did you have a question? I see your hand is raised. Okay. Hey, 
Okay, so um, our agenda for today, we're going to have three segments. After each segment, we'll have a Q&A session after each segment. If you have a question that pops in your mind while um, someone is presenting, feel free to also put that in the chat so you don't forget it. I know sometimes I forget when it's on the tip of your, tip of your mind, tip of your tongue while we're going through this. Um, <clears throat> please support a safe place for all participants. Also, please stay on mute. That way everybody can hear. Um, use your camera if you'd like. If not, feel free to take it off. And like I said, please place your questions in the chat box. You can do that anytime during the segments. And then we'll go over that at the end of each segment. Uh, feel free to join in the conversation and concepts by sharing any ideas in the chat box as well that will go out to all participants. And then everybody can see if you have an idea to share out as well. And we have our objectives for this evening. So this is the day in and out. This will be a segment, um, segment that um, actually, are we, Betsy, are we missing a slide? Segment yeah, one. Just move it forward. That's segment one. Okay. Then, yeah. So, uh, hi, I'm just going to chime in because I really want everyone to re be reminded that when we're doing our summer planning and our daily activities, that's an intentional recipe, which talks about putting the Pennsylvania Keystone Stars um, standards with the academic standards. And so I pulled this right out of the Keystone Stars required standards EC 2.2 lesson plans are developed using Pennsylvania Early Learning Standards as a resource for staff to support planning and documentation of children's learning, reflect that balance of activities that support developmentally appropriate um, learning through play. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a real believer that we should be learning all the time. People that know me know that I, I'm a firm believer in, in learning all of the time. So, <laughs> When we work through this um, whole philosophy, we don't want to have our summer program or before or after school programs to look like school, but it is a, an opportunity to be providing um, some great um, learning experiences for children and that our Keystone Star Standards support this and it should be a framework for the activities that you're planning. You can advance the next slide. Thank you. So some of the things to think about when you're talking about um, this intentional planning is using planning templates. And when you have your planning templates that you create, um, it's um, important to use the, the learning domains and so that you know that you can use all of them. The other thing that you'll see is most of you guys are using the Sapper View as a assessment tool. And within that, you're going to see a lot of different threads about academic in there. The other thing too is sometimes it's hard to, we, when we're trying to balance this voice and choice and this freedom of play with children, which is extremely important to make sure that um, we, we reflect back on what happened and say, oh, you know what? I noticed the kids haven't really been going to the science center, or I noticed we haven't done science activity all week long. So that's that place where you reflect and then you ask the can someone please mute? If you're not muted, we need to have you muted. Um, and you, you scratch your head and you say, oh, you know what? Maybe I need to go look at their science materials and see why they're not going over to that particular area. It may be something that they're not interested in right now, or it may be that none of the materials are um, developmentally appropriate. So reflect on, and on those gaps of what's happening in the program and fill those gaps to make sure that the kids are getting all of the academic areas um, and the academic standards are aligned with your curriculum. The other um, little simple thing that you can do is identify your materials with color coding dots. So if it's the um, social emotional um, element and you might um, use that same color dot with your actual activities that would support social emotional learning. So you might have some activities like a science activity might be red and, uh, and you'd put that red dot on that science activity. So that's a way also to kind of say, hey, we're, we're, we're making sure we're navigating our classroom to make sure that we are um, having all of these opportunities available. And then lastly, I just wanna say that project-based learning with webbing is also a way 
to think about and, and theme-based um, programming where you think about, okay, we're going to talk about, um, about um, the Olympics. So how can we make sure that we bring in some historical aspects of the Olympics? How can we bring science into the Olympics um, and so forth? So thinking just very intentionally because it is a requirement of our stars, but as I want to say, it's that learning through play that's important. So that's just a preface and a framework and a foundation that um, we think is important to bring out to everybody. So thank you. Next slide. Okay, so just um, we're just going to go over a little bit with room arrangement and changes that you can do to your program to support COVID practices. So number one, flexibility is key. You are doing your best to plan ahead of time and you design the room or your space whatever your however your summer program looks um, but don't be upset when you have children in there and it's not working um, so flexibility is really a, a key to <clears throat> making sure that uh, you're you're meeting the needs of the children in your in your program because the children in your program this summer may not be the same as the children that were in your program last summer. So you're going to redesign to accommodate those children, their interests, their likes, and things like that. So having um, if you have children in your program currently that are going to also be there in the summer, so maybe doing a little survey with them uh, to see if, you know, is there things that they're interested in or they would like to do over the summer that you can fit into uh, the design of your room. And then when summer actually happens, be flexible, it's okay. Redesign to make it work. Um, because like I said, you're planning ahead. Um, and then whenever you get your children into your summer program, you know, if it, works or doesn't work, um, you know, feel free to redesign it. That's okay. Um, you can make changes throughout your, your summer program. Also, redesigning your schedule. Um, your schedule may, may change uh, throughout your program, maybe during the day. Uh, you see that, you know, children are getting really irritable around lunchtime and they have to wait for lunch. Um, can you move your lunchtime up a little bit, you know, and, and skew your meal times a little bit here and there to meet those needs of, of um, all the children in your program? Um, also, redesigning your schedule to utilize spaces. Uh, we're, we're still you know, in the midst of, of COVID guidelines um, for the summer. So, you know, you might want to think about how you can change your schedule to utilize your space. <clears throat> so there's indoor space modifications um, that I'm going to talk about. And then also really utilizing the outdoor space, which I'm not gonna go into a whole lot because we're gonna hear from Chuck. And he's going to talk about um, outdoor activities um, and fun in the forefront. Michelle and Faith are going to be talking about field trips. We're going to be talking about virtual field trips. So I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. But planning your schedule to utilize outdoor space, picnic tables, sitting underneath a tree, planning activities outside. <clears throat> I'm going to focus um, a little bit more on the indoor space modifications. So looking at how you can redesign your space. Um, some things that you can do and some things that we've done in our programs is for instance, the, the block area, the children love the block area. Um, they love to build in the building section. Can you divide that out? Can you make multiple block areas or construction areas in your program where you know, one, one or two children can be in, in that section um, spaced out. Um, do you have enough blocks? Can you, you know, get cardboard blocks? Um, I know my one school H program, they love to build with the cardboard blocks. Yes. So can you make that its own center? 
And then looking at um, if you have maker space or, or, or a, a STEM space, can you, um, you know, can you turn that into small sections where the children can maybe work on specific projects at a table instead of being in the whole STEM center? Um, are, are you able to take your reading center? Like my one program, we have four or five different reading cubbies where they can, you know, we have some books. So, you know, we have our book, book area, but then we also have some select books in that one smaller area where only one child is. And we just um, position them around the room. So there's um, additional uh, spaces for them to be separated a little bit. Then how can, you know, <clears throat> can you utilize other space in your area um, where if you're housed in a school program or a, a school building or you're on your own, can you utilize some other spaces that are in there? You know, can you use a corner of, you know, the lunch area or things like that? Uh, how can you make additional spaces within, you know, can you, um, you know, put up partitions, maybe add some additional tables where children can take things to tables and be spread out. So just looking at it a little bit different um, of how you can still incorporate all those great things that they love to do, but just um, make it so that it fits in your program. Like I said, you're really going to you know, summer is fun. Kids want to be outside. So we're really going to look at some of those really fun things that you can do to incorporate and really utilize your outdoor space as well. Um, changing your schedule, you know, you have groups outside, you have groups inside, um, and then making, making uh, those changes to your program in that capacity as well. So I am going to turn it over to Michelle and Faith, and they are going to go over some typical weekly scheduling and field trips. <clears throat> Good evening. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. So, all right. So um, my name's Michelle Russell, and I'm the school age child care coordinator for Summit Early Learning. Um, I oversee and direct all school age services for um, our program. Also with me tonight is Faith Dietrich. She's the school age manager. Um, Faith directly supervises all programs and staff. And we're just gonna share a little bit about what a typical day or week may look like at our summer camp. And you can go ahead and advance that slide. So here's a typical on-site schedule. Um, it includes a structured morning, followed by midday afternoon activities. Um, within that time frame, we offer many child-driven activities that include free play, outside play, some indoor activities. Um, additionally, we set aside three to four different times throughout the day to really be intentional and to offer our planned <laughs> curriculum, um, which includes STEM, or maybe in our makerspace area, and also include, which is new for the summer, our community outreach activities. Um, this summer, due to COVID and not really being able to go many places or um, so we decided to bring partner and bring a lot of um, local community organizations to us. So they could be in person, it could be pre-recorded or maybe some Zoom activities that will include nutrition, health and wellness, reading, art, music and science. I'm really excited about this and excited to have them be part of our weekly routine coming in every every day, every week. You can go ahead and advance it. Advance the slide, thank you. So here's an example of a two week activity planning calendar, um, which is created by the lead teacher. And again, they work on this um, many weeks, months in advance to summer camp. And they release these uh, planning calendars every two weeks um, to the families and children. This calendar includes all the lessons they plan, the trips, special activities, and events happening at camp. Even this one includes, you know, having some days off. This is uh, the week before camp actually, uh, the week that school ends and camp starts. 
The calendar is created two weeks at a time and is based on our summer theme or monthly themes. So little specific stuff about Summit. Um, we are celebrating, our theme for the summer is celebrating the past and creating the future. Um, this was our theme from last summer, but due to COVID, obviously we were unable to really celebrate that in conjunction with our 50 year agency anniversary, which we were going to go ahead and take a look back at our first year when we introduced a theme, um, that united all of our school age programming. And also we, we started to add a special big trip. Um, we go, we field trip locally, but we decided to kind of um, go down to DC one summer, Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair, the Crayola factory. So um, that all kind of started to come, to come together. At that time, we, when we were planning back then, um, we planned activities and trips because we thought they'd be fun and they were, but now we know that, you know, without even realizing it, we were introducing our children to what we refer to now as STEAM or STEM. So all of our activities have always included STEM, travel, art, and even interpersonal and that social emotional learning. Um, but we are just being really intentional now. Um, this summer, we're breaking our three months down into more uh, a specific focus. So June will be just getting to know you. Um, the month of July is going to be all about travel and journey. In August, we'll focus specifically on STEM. Um, all of the lessons prepare youth for the future to ignite learning, inspire creativity, and activate themselves experiences. We're, we are very excited for summer 2021, probably like everyone else, just to have the kids back into the program, um, providing a, a, a program for them to attend every day. So I am now gonna pass it along to Faith and she's gonna share some um, information about field trips, our field trip calendar, um, as well as what an off-site day looks like. Hello, besides our curriculum, another way we unite learning and inspire creativity and activate experiences through our field trips. My slide's not up. Thank you. Field trips help break up the week, gives the students a new environment and provides another learning opportunity. Our field trips are all outdoors for the fresh air and less restrictive with COVID guidelines for this summer. We are on site three days and we're off site two days, but all of our day are similar, are similar offering activities on or off site. Our field trip times are more mid morning, late afternoon times. So we try to still provide a structured morning activity. We provide our curriculum, we develop our curriculum to be able to be presented on field trips along with adding additional gross motor activities at the park with supplies. We ask each student to have their backpack along with a backpack and with a pack lunch and water bottle and a sturdy shoe to keep everyone safe while we're on the field trip. All of our field trips are pre-planned before camp starts with depart and return times that are given to each family. Next slide. Here's an example of our field trip calendar given to families. Our field trip calendar, we include the site cell phone number, the head teacher contact information and all depart and return times for field trips so families can plan ahead. We include notes at the bottom of reminders and if camp is changing locations. Our field trip calendar is subject to change. We will be, so each week we are offsite two days um, on a field trip this summer. Um, we are able to offer a, par a local park to explore and get outdoors. And we're also going to local pools which is a fan favorite. We also partnered with our local library. We are where we were able to, we are where we're able to go and have a plan curriculum facilitated by the library staff. We are also offering on-site special days on Wednesday that include science fair, art fair, bike days, water days, and et cetera of just fun things for the kids.
Okay, thank you, Faith and Michelle. So next we will hear from um, oh, <clears throat> we will hear from Chuck, who's going to go over some outdoor activities and and fun for you. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Chuck Averso. I'm the summer camp director for Neshaminy School uh, Neshaminy Kids Club. Uh, and I get to talk to you about some fun activities we can do in the summer. So um, we all know the games, the typical group games um, that we play, you know, kickball, soccer, basketball. Uh, with COVID going on, you can still play these games, um, but it's a great time to teach the skills of these games that we can keep a little more distance. You can uh, actually get involved in teaching them how to kick the balls, how to shoot the balls, uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know, with the time that that you have during the summer, it, you can really start them off learning the, the the basic skills of the game, then move them into the actual game themselves, and actually have a more uh, fun and more competitive game later on in the summer. Um, through my experiences, that's what I think really works best is teaching them those skills in the beginning, and then working the way up to the uh, bigger game. Um, and then some other summer games that are just fantastic for summertime is Gaga. Um, if you guys don't know what Gaga is, it's basically a, uh, you have a picture right there. There's basically a pit uh, where they play dodgeball and they, uh, you know, below the, they get hit with the dodgeball below the waist and the kids absolutely love it. Um, it's not the best for socially distancing, um, but you know, you can limit the numbers inside the pit and uh, you know the kids just absolutely love it and at our camp they always want to play it uh, another one that i've um had a lot of success uh, success with if you have the space use it and that's giant capture flag it's just capture flag but instead of a smaller boundary you use huge boundaries you get the kids to run and you know the more they run the more they use their energy the better behaved they will become because they're tired um and then they their parents love it because they come home and they're tired and, you know, it's a lot, makes life a lot easier for everyone. Um, so I can always suggest if you have a lot of space, like we are fortunate enough to have to utilize it to the best of your abilities. You can go to the next slide. Uh, other outdoor activities, um, a little more less intensive like games is gardening. Um, you can start small with potted plants, small vegetables. Uh, you can do a lot of art extensions like that, like painting rocks to put in your garden. Um, you know, painting different types of plant and vegetable labels instead of just your typical one that comes with it. Um, you know, having somebody who's maybe interested in it, uh, you know, teaching them about how plants work and the different types of things that go into it. So it's also science extensions. Um, nature walks with a scavenger hunt. Go for a quick walk on your grounds, see what you can find, and then write them down and make the kids find them. Uh, you can make a nature walk go for an hour. And if you have things to look for and can find different things like deer tracks or, you know, uh, a, a crowd favorite's always going to be rabbit poop and deer poop. Uh, you know, you're always going to have kids that are going to be happy and, you know, for whatever reason, poop makes them smile nowadays. So um, if you can afford to get Water slides, they're always going to be a great hit. Um, we do water slides once a week uh, with different age groups and you know, the kids just absolutely love it. You can also uh, do water slide kickball, which instead of running the bases, they water slide the bases. It's a lot of fun to do. Um, some other water games, sponge tag, it's real simple. You need two, spo two, two buckets and a sponge for each team and a pool. They take the sponge, go fill it up with water, bring it back and fill up the bucket and they relay it. And that, um, that's, or uh, I'm sorry, that's kind of, kind of mixing the two games together. Uh, there's also uh, sponge tag, which is a bunch of sponges and they just tag each other with the sponges. And then to fill the bucket relay using the same sponges, go and like I said, to the pool and um, bring it back. Um, these games have, all, have worked so far. We've done these for about two or three years at our camp and they've really seemed to work. Uh, again, I know it's not the most COVID friendly things, um, but at the same time, it is still summer and the kids have to have some fun. So, you know, doing the best you can, keeping them distance, you know, you don't have more than one kid on a water slide. So, um, you know, you don't maybe necessarily don't have to do the tag stuff, but um, 
you know, just try to get them to have fun and, and utilize the things that you can do on a daily basis. Um, and then the fun doesn't have to stop. So if a child is interested in an activity, expand on it. Like I said earlier, if you have a bunch of kids that really like kickball or really like baseball, teach them the skills of kicking the ball, teach them the skills of hitting it, of you know how how they're supposed to run the bases. Um, really expand on it. That's what the summertime's for. It, it gives you the time to really get down and dirty and teach the skills of the games. Um, let the children continue the activity. Schedule and routine are important, but if the children are actively engaged, let it go longer. Uh, I know that there's sometimes where you just can't, you know, you can't go longer than the time allotted, and that's understandable. But if if they're really having fun, there's no reason to stop the fun. Let them play, uh, you know, and it leads right into flexibility. Uh, if it's not working, change it up. And if it is working, keep on going. Uh, there's just nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know what, this isn't working. We got to stop. We got to find something else. Always have a plan B. And there's also nothing with the opposite way of, wow, this is really working. I want to keep going. Uh, I, I know I would never stop any of my staff from, from keep keep going and expanding on activity because if you're having fun, that means the kids are having fun. And if the kids are having fun, they're engaged, they're learning. And that's what we want. That's what we want in a summer camp program. Uh, and finally, uh, if you guys have any, you can go to the next slide, Austin. If you guys have any, if you would like to, any lesson plans or questions or resources from me, I have a ton of stuff I can email you. So there's my email. Please don't hesitate to reach out uh, with anything you guys want to know. Uh, any questions about, you know, any of the games I talked about, any other games. I have tons and tons of resources that I put together for uh, over, over 12 years now. So I would be more than happy to share that stuff with you. And I want you guys to have a, a fantastic summer and, you know, enjoy your time. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, so next we have um, Betsy, who's gonna go going to go over some virtual field trips with us. Betsy? So hello, and thank you. And I want to just piggyback on Chuck and even this whole COVID concept is that if you have to be in close quarters with each other, using a mask is sufficient. So, you know, the kids may just need to mask up if they wanna be doing some of these activities that require them to be closer, um, even in the outdoor space. So there's always that alternative for people to, you know, social distance as, as best as you can, but also using that mask is also a good protection and being outside is always a great protection. So um, virtual field trips, I just wanna mention, um, I used to teach this way back before COVID, um, around just get, you know, going out and seeing things, but doing it in a virtual space. We know with COVID, kids are spending a lot of screen time right now. Um, and so this might not be the ultimate for you, but you also, if you're not getting out and about and you want to do some field tripping, this is a nice way to do it. So it's low cost. It's safe. You can um, place it anywhere in your schedule. So it doesn't have to be, you know, planning a trip paying the funds, getting the bus and so forth. It's like, oh, you know what? Let's go tripping today and, and, and go on a field trip on that way. Um, you can do pre-work and post-work. So, you know, before the trip, think about some different things that they might want to know about. And then as well, finishing up and doing a culminating activity around the trip that you um, went on virtually. And then navigating it local and far away. So there is no expense to this um, as long as you have your Wi-Fi. So the couple of things that I would say to, to, I would mention is that as you're talking about virtual field trips, it is important for the teacher to do the navigating and do some pre-work and find some websites where good virtual trips are, just because of the dangers of internet access and what kids could stumble into. I don't think you want it on, on your program hour. So I strongly recommend that you monitor and figure out some good strong websites for kids to go on to first. National Geographic would be um, one and so forth. 
listen to the kid's interests and go off of this. So whatever that child's interests are, um, it would be the place to start and to look at these virtual field trips. So when, what I might find exciting, like I'd be going to gardens and art museums where kids would be like, oh my gosh, like we don't wanna do that. So listen to them. Listen to what their interests are. You know, if a kid's into race cars or something, hey, let's let's see if we can find, you know, the, the closest racetrack to where our program is, and see if they have a website and see if they have some races shown on on um, their website and things that have occurred. Also, with COVID the way it is now, a lot of program, a lot of like museums and stuff have virtual um, showings. So, I mean, I'm a five senses girl. I like to use all my five senses to learn. So it may not be ideal, but it's still um, better than nothing. Um, the other thing too, is you can do Google Earth. It's literally called Google Earth and it'll bring you right to that location. So that's something to experiment with. Sometimes in the old days, you used to, to download an enhanced type of thing. I don't know if you still need to do that. Looking for videos, lots and lots and lots of videos now um are uh, available um for you to navigate things i when i was doing some navigating um i found iceland and 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 finding different places in iceland and how this hotel that you could stay in is totally made out of ice and so forth so that was pretty interesting the other thing i would say as a tip is make sure if you can have a powerpoint projector or a big screen or whiteboard something to display the field trip on so more than one child um is able to view it at a time. If not, then you just need to use your computer screen um, and that's okay too. So um, let's advance the next slide. So these are just some pictures of Niagara Falls. And I, I, I show these to you because there's a pretty big variety there. And so you could ask some questions about Niagara Falls as you viewed these pictures um, and, you know, ask, ask children questions about them or ask them what their favorite picture is or even expand it to an art project and so forth or making your own falls, figure out how to make your own fall um, within the program. So extending the learning experience pre or post um, is a, a good idea. And obviously, if you've ever seen Niagara Falls, pictures can't do it justice, even just a rumbling noise and so forth. But it's definitely um, a conversation. And it would be interesting for kids to know that the person in the left-hand cor down corner actually um, went over the falls in that barrel. So um, just some historical elements that kids would not know about otherwise. And even investigating how that water tumbles and what that mist is and how that occurs, what the, the falls look like in the winter. There's all kinds of inquiry-based questions that you can um, have kids investigate for further learning. Um, next slide, please. And then I just took a local place in a local town. And to the very right, you'll see a ship. And on that ship, it's, it sits on the main street in town, history of how that town was established. And so to me, that was kind of fascinating. This, the Scottish people got stuck on the Susquehanna River and couldn't figure out, um, like they needed help. And so they settled in this little town called Mount Joy. And so there's um, neat little historical things that you can learn about. Um, the one to the um, top is Booby's Brewery, which if you look the picture right below it is the catacombs where you can go and eat dinner. So kids, um, and you eat with pewter and it's medieval and, and it's lit by candles. Up at the top is a turbine that was used to manufacture things um, at Booby's Brewery. And then in the very, down below, you would never really realize this, but in the middle of the town, you go downstairs and there's um, on both sides, there's a, a, the Amtrak train runs right through the middle of the town. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting place as well. So thinking locally too, for kids to say, oh, what's in our backyard and things that they might not know about and just to start to spark their interest like above and beyond Hershey Park and, and so forth. So. So that's some virtual field trip stuff. We did not, we had one comment in the chat, but um, we just had a child share his love of dinosaurs that sparked us to take virtual trips to museums and learn things like how they make a skin to cover fossils to make them look so real. Very cool. So thank you Shasta for sharing that. 
Does anyone have any questions about the things that we've just had over segment one? Any questions from anybody? You can put them in the chat box. Okay, I don't see anything in there, so we're going to proceed to our next segment. Sorry, I couldn't get myself off mute. <laughs> it kept disappearing. Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce Claudia Hanold, who is with the Community Services for Children. Uh, she is going to talk to us about STEM and why it is so important. Claudia? Thank you, Shasta, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just briefly uh, going to talk uh, about three things three things. What is STEM and why is STEM education so important um, in after school programs and in general? And then the next uh, question is where can you get high quality STEM professional development? So I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. And then we are looking for resources uh, and ideas, um, you know, where you can get some, some good ideas for uh, high quality STEM programming from. Uh, next slide, please, Shasta. So what is STEM education? Um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education is an in integrated interdisciplinary and student-centered approach to learning that encourages curiosity, creativity, artistic expression, collaboration, computational thinking, communication, problem solving, critical thinking, and design thinking. That uh, definition is taken right off the uh, website from the Department of Education in, in Pennsylvania. And for me, there are a couple of words that really um, um, stick out and that I find very um, important. The first one is that it is an integrated interdisciplinary approach, um, which means that we need to discover ways to integrate science, technology, engineering in math and math with other subjects. Student centered is another word um, that uh, is very important for me. Um, we know that children when they are young are very, very interested. Uh, in science and they have kind of like a born curiosity. They take things apart, they look at things. And I always like to tell the story when my child was, was very little and not very well supervised playing in the backyard and came to me and said um, on his little tyke table and said he needed a, a bucket of water because the table was all gutty. And I'm like, gutty, I don't even know that word. And he said, we cut a squirrel apart and now it has guts all over. But that really shows you how, how very curious um, young children are about science um, and you know science subjects. So what we want to do is we want to have a, a student-centered approach so that students don't lose this, uh, curio curiosity and uh, stay really excited about science, technology, engineering, and math. The next thing, and that is not on this slide, is um, that we want to connect uh, to um, activities or, uh, that kind of reflect jobs in our real world. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a, in a little bit. Um, and then as a teacher, um, you should really kind of, when, when you're doing uh, STEM, you should have an understanding about the science uh, behind the, um, the subject that you are doing. So this is a slide um, that explains why STEM education is so important. And I'm not going to read the slide. But what is really um, sticking out, and we hear that all the time, um, that there is a huge job market for STEM careers. So employers need people 
um, who are STEM uh, literate and who can fill these positions. Uh, the next point is uh, high wages. Um, average salaries of um, people in computer science are around 85,000. There's many unfilled jobs. So um, the job outlook and the wages for STEM careers are very high. Um, and the, the last bullet I have uh, in red, uh, research shows that STEM instruction offers major benefits in a student's post-secondary career, even if that student does not necessarily pursue a STEM career. And that has to do with the uh, career readiness skills that we are teaching in STEM education. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the, not the next slide, but the slide after that. So could you, okay, thank you, Shasta. So when we teach STEM, um, we hopefully will ha end up with students who are STEM literate and are able to apply their skills to solve everyday problems and then transfer um, what they're learning in STEM activities to other situations um, that prepares them for the workforce for tomorrow. And then the next slide, please. Thank you, Shasta. So this is also from the website of the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, and we're looking here at the career ready skills, uh, PACRS. Um, the Pennsylvania career ready skills are social emotional learning progressions uh, that support uh, the development of student competence. And the idea behind this is that when students graduate, uh, they possess the knowledge, abilities, and habits to enter and compete a complete post-secondary education and move to a successful career. So the career ready still, uh, skills are really um, uh, split up in three buckets that the self-awareness and self-management, establishing and maintaining relationships, and social problem solving skills. And there are related skills you can see on the right side um, of the slide. And those are really skills that we are teaching students um, in STEM education. So you can see that um, adaptability, initiative, planning and organization, uh, problem solving, uh, decision making, critical thinking, um, teamwork, communication, respect, um, and so on are, are, are skills that we are teaching in scam, uh, STEM. And those are skills that get students ready um, to be successful in post-secondary education and in jobs, no matter whether it is a STEM job or not. So really, just in, in one slide, STEM is innovation because students need to innovate and think about it. It's a transdisciplinary approach, so we can go over different uh, disciplines. Um, it derives from questions that are naturally asked. Um, so Shasta gave a great example. She said that she had a child that was interested in dinosaurs and then um, questions around that uh, arise and she, she was able to um, do a field trip or build build something around that. It It is uh, deeply rooted in real world current issues or questions. Then of course it is about preparing the workforce um, for jobs that may not even exist yet. Um, and it is of course about communication uh, social media, um, all those things are invented by, by very young people. Okay, so where can you get professional development? Um, my recommendation Bye -bye. is... My recommendation is to uh, join um, the Pennsylvania School Age um, Child Care Alliance. There is a free membership um, that just gives you a basic uh, membership. And then there is a, uh, a membership um, 
that's that's a little bit higher by by you're paying a, a small fee. Poseidon also has a free membership, and I really encourage you to join that too and join the mailing lists. And the National After School Association has um, different types of memberships, but they also have a lot of uh, STEM resources and STEM trainings um, on their website. Uh, next slide, please. So Better Kid Care um, has um, the Click to Science uh, modules um, available for, for on demand. Um, so there are 20 modules um, to help frontline staff uh, facilitate uh, STEM experiences. And they are uh, divided into like three buckets, uh, planning STEM experiences, interacting with youth during STEM and building STEM skills in youth. So there's 20 modules right there um, on the Better Kid Care website. Next slide, please, Shasta. So Click to Science um, has its, its, its own website and Click to Science uh, offers STEM professional development for out of school programs. So they have different materials for frontline staff and volunteers, for trainers and coaches, and for program leaders. So there are staff development guides. Those are step-by-step -step guides designed for coaches and trainers who are working with frontline staff. Um, then there are the self-directed web lessons. And those are those 20 lessons um, that are on Better Kid Care, um, you know, where staff can do a two-hour module and earn PCOS credit on, on these 20 different topics. Um, and then also on the Click to Science web that are month, uh, month, monthly webinars on STEM learning. What I have on this slide is kind of like a little um, cycle of the professional uh, development model that better uh, that click to science developed um, it starts kind of with a needs assessment um, where staff or uh, the supervisor determine what what really need uh, the staff should focus on uh, then there is a web lesson um, that corresponds to a skill um, that the staff will be learning and then in between there is uh, training, coaching, practice, meeting with supervisors or with, with uh, peers to discuss what is learned and then additional practice and coaching and practice. So you see that this is not just a, a, a web lesson, lesson, but there's a whole lot of training and coaching and discussion uh, and practice built uh, around this uh, skill that the staff is is working on and it's really worth visiting this website uh, and look for some professional uh, development uh, around stem so the next uh, couple of slides are around resources um, one of my favorite sites is code.org. Uh, code.org uh, code ho hosts the Hour of Code. And I actually uh, took a screenshot of the Hour of, of Code. The Hour of Code are very simple. Most of them are simple. Um, one hour coding activities uh, for children or adults. Um, and they have a really nice searchable database of their activities um, on the Hour of Code uh, website. So you can choose by um, are you a beginner or are you comfortable with coding? Um, what grade is the student in? Um, do you have computers on your side or not? Um, so poor internet connection or no computer. So you can have kind of like unplugged um, coding activities and you can search by by topics. So when when you do these activities, there's usually a succession of activities that build on each other that are scaffolded, where students um, solve 
little puzzles or skills. And then at the end, uh, you know, for example, in the dance party, they learn how to how to code simple dance movements. Um, and then at the end there, the, the final activity is they create a, a dance. Um, these are, there, there's a lot of resources for teachers there so that teachers understand coding. And we hear that all the time that, uh, you know, teachers sometimes don't want to do these activities because um, they lack the, the training and skills, but all of these uh, hour of code activities have teacher guides um, that that help teachers uh, with introducing those activities. And then on code.org, there are also a lot of um, training resources um, for teachers um, and then additional resources for children. I have done some of the hour of code activities in school age programs, and I don't know really anything about coding. Um, what I do when children come to me and get stuck, I, I say ask three before you ask me. So they usually uh, find somebody who solves uh, those puzzles with them. So then you have the social emotional learning and the teamwork and the helping each other in that as, as well. Okay, uh, next slide. Thank you. Summer Brain Game. So the Museum of Chicago, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, every year uh, puts out Summer Brain Games. So those are simple science activities um, that children can do either in an after school program or at home uh, with parents. Um, they are built around very cheap, um, readily available materials. And um, so every year they're yeah. coming, they're coming out well, with all this thing. No. No. They're coming out with, with additional activities. Um, they're not out for, yet for this year, but then on the website is a collection of all the activities um, that they have done uh, in the past. Thank you. And the next slide is Exploratorium. Um, that is a museum, I believe, in San Francisco. Also has a variety of science activities um, on their website. And you can search by, by subject uh, area. So that is also a, a wealth of information on that, on that slide. So, and then we talked about uh, a little bit that, that it should be ch uh, child-centered and it should be related to the real world. So, and I just saw in the National Geographic, a little write-up about the 17 year cicada uh, that is coming here <laughs> soon to Pennsylvania. I'm looking forward to it at the end of this month. But I'm sure there are a lot of questions uh, and a lot of ideas um, you know, to to work on that with with school age children and uh, maybe do a cicada scavenger hunt. Why are they here? What are the stages? How loud they are? So there's a little science experiment that you can do um, where you take a, a, a plastic container and put a foil over it um, and put like salt or paper clips on it and put it under a tree to see uh, to see if the sound is able to, to move that. Um, what is dripping from the tree? So when you are under a tree with a whole lot of cicadas, so there's actually some gooey stuff dripping off the trees. And then what do they do? So there are a lot of questions that children may have that you can um, answer um, in a STEM uh, classroom. Betsy talked a little bit before about webbing. And this would be a great um, way to, to put some webbing uh, into that. So how can you, what, what can you do with it? Can you bring some history into it? So 17 years ago, this is when the cicadas were here last time. Um, what did, you know, Pennsylvania look like 17 years ago? There was before the pandemic, um, 
we didn't we didn't do Zoom meetings like we do now. Who was the president at that time? Um, what did cars look like? So there's a, a whole lot of of webbing that that you could do, and then reach out and and create uh, lesson plans around that. And this is just an example of you know something that's happening um, here in a couple of of weeks um, in most in most of Pennsylvania. So the key points really is, uh, you know, have a mission that mat matters, think big, uh, but start small. Look at continuous improvement, strive for that and look for ideas everywhere. Share everything. Chuck was so kind and said he's sharing lesson plans with you. And this is really the idea uh, behind STEM. We, we, we can share everything uh, amongst each other. And then spark imagination and then fuel it with data. So you need to um, get uh, data and, uh, you know, get the science right as well. Okay, that was my part. Are there any questions? I looked in the chat box and I don't see any. So we'll give people a second to do that. We Our timing is really good at 7.30. So we're going to get started um, in a minute with Lisa. But before we do that, I do want to mention that people were having problems finding the handouts in the chat box. So I re put them in the chat box. So if you want to take a moment now, because um, there's some links and stuff that you may want for later um, later use, in particular with the ones that um, Claudia shared out. So um, that PDF is in there for you to utilize. So let's just take a pause for a moment and um, we'll give you a minute to download those um, actual um, documents that I've talked about. Yes, thank you so much, Claudia. <clears throat> Some great resources. Um, I think I'll be changing. We will not be picnicking underneath the drippy trees this summer. <laughs> I don't want to know what the drippy stuff is. <laughs> We're having it in my lunch. We all know what that is, Shasta. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to comment too that um, I have a friend in Maryland and she's just maybe an hour south of, of Pennsylvania and um, they are seeing cicadas now. And I live in the woods, so I'm kind of wondering what this will be like. So. Okay, someone says they still don't see them. Um, make sure you're looking at the chat box for everyone and not just a direct message as well. Um, that might be part of the issue. But they are in there now, I see them. So you might want to scroll up a little bit. But she put them in while Claudia was speaking. Okay, any other questions for STEM? If not, then we will move on to Miss Lisa Stoffer, who is going to um, talk about um, social emotional learning. What is it? Why it's important? Um, Lisa. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Thank, thank you for the welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa. I am currently the communications and events chair for SEL for PA. I've previously worked within school age programs as, um, as a teacher, as an assistant director, as a director. And I uh, also was a previous Keystone Stars quality coach where I supported um, school age programs in the Southeast region of PA. Um, I'm an avid follower of all things Mr. Rogers. Um, he really is an SEL advocate and was ahead of his time. I am a wife to a husband who keeps me very open-minded and a mother to two daughters. Um, they have extremely different temperaments, which would ast astounds me because they were raised by the same parents in the same household and in the same setting. So for them to have such different temperaments, it really keeps me on my own SEL toes, so to speak. So next slide, please. 
So um, as Shasta said, I will be discussing um, SEL or social emotional learning. I'm gonna be talking about what it is. Uh, this will be where I'll give some formal definitions, but then I'll break it down into at least one person's perspective for a deeper understanding. Um, we'll be going into why it's important and I promise not to hit you over the head with a lot of data. Um, I will be giving some steps on how to get started specifically in your setting as a child, school age childcare or summer setting um, and maybe perhaps getting a little cheesy with it. And then finally, I prepared for some resources for you to use. Next slide, please. So SEL or social emotional learning can have many different definitions and take on different structures. So for example, one definition from Castle is SEL is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. In Pennsylvania, social and emotional learning is identified as a key learning area in the PA learning standards, where the standards focus on self-awareness and self-management, establishing and maintaining relationships and decision-making and responsible behavior. As Claudia mentioned too, Pennsylvania has also developed the Career Ready Skills as a support to the Career Ready Initiative, where the focus is on the three domains she mentioned, self-awareness and self-management, establishing and maintaining relationships and social problem solving. So breaking all this down, all three of them encompass very similar verbiage, but essentially what SEL is, is the process of learning a strong sense of self and developing and growing relationships in order to be best prepared for college, future careers and life. So the way I see SEL is sort of like a Venn diagram with three different circles. You have circle one, and that's how you interact with yourself. And I know we all do it. We have that inner voice where um, sometimes that inner voice is really nice and sweet and boosts your confidence. But then other times you, that voice knows exactly what to say to get you fired up or maybe down. Um, circle two is how you interact with your peers, your friends, your family. This is that relationship building piece and how well you're able to start the relationship, maintain the relationship, etc. And then circle three, how you interact with all others. So your community, the workplace, places of worship. And so this is the decision-making, problem-solving and critical thinking part of that puzzle. And it's within uh, the overlap of all these circles because they really rely heavily on each other that the overlapping shows the importance of SEL and building these skills. Next slide, please. So this leads to why SEL is so important. Let's first tackle this from an evidence perspective. Um, the evidence demonstrates that social and emotional learning improves mental health, social skills and behavior, academic achievement, and college and career readiness. SEL supports equitable learning environments and optimal developmental outcomes for diverse children, adolescents, and adults. So if you look on the infographic on this slide, you can see that you can see just some of the data on how SEL supports setting each of these environments so that all students can excel. When this SEL is integrated into the curriculum, there's an 83% increase in the social and emotional skills of students. And then that translates to nine out of 10 students with high social and emotional intelligence who perform well academically and then so forth. This makes sense because our brains focus on skills that need developing for survival. If I'm a third grader getting ready for the kickball game of the century, but I can't even make the team because I don't have the skills needed to make friends, how am I gonna be able to focus on the multiplication problem that I was just asked by my teacher? Okay, so now let's focus on why SEL is important from a what can it do for me perspective. So to get to the nitty gritty, Let's think of some of the traumatic experiences we all have in common. Take 9-11, for example. We all watched on that day the tragedy and the pain, but 
but I know I didn't really discuss my feelings with anyone or, you know, didn't seek any other supports. And it felt as though life just sort of continued. I went to school the next day and carried on with my responsibilities. Now, I am sure that supports were offered, but it was in the way of, if you need to talk to someone, the guidance counselor's door is open. And with such a un blanket statement, unfortunately, I don't, didn't realize at the time, I should have talked about my feelings to someone. I know, again, referencing Mr. Rogers, our SEL hero, he did a special on the events and perhaps ways to cope, but at the time he was aged, he was tired, and even he mentioned not feeling up to the challenge. So now here we are, 20 years later, and we have a global pandemic. So schools have been closed or virtual or hybrid and everything in between, and SEL supports are not as robust as they should be. And what would Mr. Rogers say about COVID-19 and social distancing? So this is where SEL can be so impactful. Being able to effectively develop and maintain healthy relationships in order to be able to talk about our feelings is one of the way SELs can help in your programs. So now think of the trauma that children in your program are facing beyond these that we have in common. I mentioned that third grader getting ready for kickball, but we all know there are children facing challenges that go beyond a play yard game. Think about their daily lives and some of the challenges their families face. Many times unwanted and negative behaviors are a child's way of crying out for help and sharing their feelings. SEL can help children and adults speak the same language to effectively communicate in an effort to prevent or avoid some of the undesired behaviors. Next slide, please. Okay, so we know what SEL is, we know why it's important, but how do you get started implementing SEL practices? So with, as with most things, there's good news and bad news. The bad news that is that upon first Google search, the information on SEL is vast. That it could seem overwhelming and not knowing where to start. I've also been at the start of implementing new ideas in a school-age childcare setting and let me tell you, getting the staff and the parents and the school all on board is not only necessary, but also somewhat of a challenge. So on that note, I have three points that serve as good news. So first, let's outline them, and then we can take a deeper dive into each point. So the three points of good news are, number one, many public schools already incorporate SEL curriculum into their everyday lessons. Number two, there are many resources and tools at your fingertips, and I know that was also mentioned as a bad news negative piece, but stay with me. And then number three, uh, as a Keystone Stars program, there are already pieces of what you are doing that could help get you and your program started. So now for that deeper dive, back to the point about SEL being in public schools. This is a great, this is great news for many reasons. Um, first, children in your program are already receiving those seeds of information that are needed in order to implement the most effective practices in your program in their class with their schools and school teachers and their peers. So they're hearing some of that language and they're practicing some of the dialogue that's needed for SEL um, practices to excel. It's a great foundation, but then think of what the wonderful activities you can do and you can plan based off of what this, the, the school is already saying, drawing out the SEL lessons. Second, this is a great opportunity for furthering the partnership between the school district and your program. Maybe you consider um, reaching out to the educational department of the district to ask them what curriculum they're using. Maybe you can see if you can support those, that messaging and your program can um, maybe pay, partner or piggyback off of some of that messaging. Remember, keeping messaging consistent for children can go a long way in the success of implementing any kind of practice. And lastly, there's a strong likelihood that if um, that same language and dialogue is reaching the children, it could be reaching the parents and the families too. So I know that sounds crazy, but I'll share a, a moment from within my own household 
when I was facing a particularly frustrating dilemma. And my oldest, who's seven, said to me in all seriousness, mommy, it looks like you need to take a belly breath. So I'm very fortunate um, that I work in the field and I knew what my daughter meant, but um, understanding that some, fam some of the families might not have that same benefit. And that actually works in your favor. Because imagine my story um, and that I didn't have a clue what belly breathing was. And then the next morning, my daughter's sitting there across from you coloring and she tells you the story uh, from the night before and, and says, but mommy doesn't really know what, what that is, what belly breathing is. What a perfect time that is for you to share some strategies with the families because if the families are buying into the SEL message, you then have consistency from the school to your program, to, your, to the home and then back again. I'm gonna to bounce to point number three um, and then we'll, we'll hit number two again. As a star two program, in order to meet indicator EC 2.2, Betsy sort of, Betsy referenced this at the beginning, um, you, evidence is needed of lesson planning. And in order to meet that, further meet that indicator, the lesson plans need to incorporate the PA early learning standards. Um, so, and, and within the PA learning standards, uh, as, we, as I mentioned, the SEL is, is uh, listed on the, in the PA learning standards as a key learning area. So basically, if your lesson planning, you want your lesson plans to have SEL threaded within your daily schedule. Um, you can do this by looking at the PA learning standards, which are on the PA key website. I've linked that into my resource slide on the next slide for you. And then you're gonna take those learning standards and link your activities to the SEL code. Now, if you're a star three or four program, one way you can gain points in the staff qualification section is to have all your staff, with the exception of those that haven't been there a year or aren't enrolled in credit bearing coursework, um, have all, those, all your staff uh, take a, an SEL training a training on social and emotional development. You can find these trainings on Better Kid Care and by doing a search on the PA key registry. This is a great foundation for staff to gain the base understanding of what SEL is, and then you can build off this as you decide exactly how you want your program to incorporate the SEL practices. Okay, so circling back to point number two, uh, there really are wonderful resources and tools to help you implement SEL practices into your program. The idea of the volume and the, the overwhelming feeling can be combated by having a bit of background knowledge from your district and following some of the start indicators so that you can, can weed through uh, all of the information and really dial down into what you would like. Once you start to peel the onion, so to speak, you get to know what to search for, um, the what toolkits you would like to use and how to start the process. I do need to remind you, however, that onions can make you cry. So the process could be uh, a lesson in SEL in and of itself. So the idea here is that just like implementing any new, and I say new because SEL is in every, all, it, SEL is in everything we do all day, every day. Um, any new practice can seem like a daunting and heavy lift, but starting with the pieces that are already in place and setting up a team to support the implementation. So your team can be your director, your lead staff, parents, the school, members of the school, maybe even some of the children um, will go a long way in getting the buy-in necessary and it's establishing the success of implementing SEL practices. Okay, so I mentioned cheese and here it comes. I hear many times from people who may or may not fully understand what school-age care is and that all we do is play. We in the sector know we do far more than that, but what, a better, what better place for strengthening SEL skills and practices than while playing. What happens when children are playing? If they're playing in a group game, they're interacting with their peers, perhaps they're social problem solving. If they're building with Legos or blocks, they're problem solving or using their critical thinking skills. And if they're in the dramatic play center, they're building and practicing relationship skills. So this quite literally means that school age care and summer care is the playground for SEL. Next slide, please. So I could have probably had 10 more slides with ample links and resources, but that could lead you back to that overwhelming and 
that end feeling. So here are some of my favorites. Um, the PA key can lead you to the PA learning standards uh, where you can find the social and emotional key learning area and the corresponding codes for lesson planning. Um, keep in mind just overall that the PA key has a vast number of links to other resources as well. Um, the link for the career ready skills has many infographics and resources, but the document that I found really helpful is a continuum. It's found at the top of the clickable options once you're on the page. And I, the reason I like this is because it outlines those three, three domains that Claudia mentioned, the self-awareness and self-management, establishing and maintaining relationships and social problem solving. And then it breaks it down how each domain can be applied to overarching age groups. CASEL is an overall great resource to get a base understanding of SEL. Uh, many organizations, programs, and practices are built off of CASEL's definition of SEL. And then of course, SEL for PA is also linked. Um, there is a specific page under resources and resources for educators um, that you all might really enjoy. I think my main message here is that although SEL is extremely important and necessary, Let's especially that, given Maria. recent and current events, school-age childcare and summer care is a wonderful place to develop these skills. And there are supports to help you. Many of the practices are either already implemented or easily implemented. And if you get lost, head to the SEL for PA website and contact me. Thank you. I want to just piggyback on something else. It's Betsy. We do have a tool that um, some of our quality coaches, myself and some other SAC leaders across the state um, have become reliable on. It's um, the SEL PQA tool through the Weikert Center. And it's very um, specific um, and just integrated into your, your daily things and intentional about making sure kids have a sense of belonging and, and different things that you can utilize um, to support SEL development. So I did want to mention that because you could ask your quality coach about that um, and they can hook you in with the program quality assessment team. And um, that's something you can start to delve into as well if you um, want to start looking at your environment with that intentional um, practices around SEL as well. That's great. There's a lot, of, a lot of really great resources on that page that Lisa just shared. And thank you, Lisa. Um, for sharing uh, those with us. Um, Betsy, I was, I don't see any questions in the chat. Did you have any come across your side? No, I don't see any questions. So either people are instinct to get out early or they, we, we covered everything really well tonight. I don't know which one it is. But last call for questions on any of the things that we walked through tonight. Go ahead, proceed then. Go ahead. I just want to thank, um, oh, y'all did a great job. And I took a lot of great notes. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that, Katrina. Okay, so um, we will be having two more plan sessions coming up. So on May 21st, we are going to be talking about the American Rescue Plan dollars. So um, there's a lot of funding coming down the pike and school age out of school time is a part of it. So join us for um, this uh, webinar and gain some understanding of how the American Rescue Plan dollars can affect your program and um, what you should um, know about it. Then on the 26th, we have another um, SAC provider for summer programming. It's going to focus on the health and safety of summer programming. And it will also include your water safety training uh, that you'll be able to use for DHS if your programs go to the pool. So you can, um, those are on the PA keys. Um, and then we also sent out a link to all of our membership as well.
Okay, so um, thank you to all of our panelists um, for providing some um, really great, hopefully some great ideas for our participants and all of our participants for coming tonight. Just some loose end certificates will be available in the next few days to the PA Keys PD registry. Again, um, make sure that you put your name in the chat along with your program so that we can make sure that you, um, as you were registered, um, you get credit for attending. And also Act 48, you're going to send that information out to Betsy so that you can have your Act 48 credit. Um, again, um, if uh, you can get on our website, join, um, join PENSACA. Uh, we send out newsletters. Uh, like I said, we're advocates for the after school programming. And um, you can keep up to date with um, uh, things like the American Rescue Plan coming down, coming down the pike. Betsy, do you have anything else to add? No, I think we're good. So thank you everybody for joining us and thank you very much to all of our presenters tonight for volunteering their time to uh, sh share their expertise on summer, summer planning. So thank you very much. Yes, get out and enjoy the last of our, our evening with the really awesome summer weather. We skipped spring, I think, but have a great night. Thank you. Thank you everybody.